Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And happy new year. Happy new year. Peace, good health, and abundant blessings to you all. Everyone here today in church on Communion Sunday deserves praise for coming out in wintry conditions and braving the roads. So nice to see you here today. Um, to those of you watching online, we extend a warm welcome and thank you for tuning in. Um, as we worship today, let us be transformed by thy word and thy spirit. Performing today will be Ray Carter, who will lead us in hymns. Afterwards, we invite you all to stay for coffee hour in the Mayflower Room for hot and cold beverages and a light snack. Yes. And if you're watching us live on Facebook, we invite you now to please share this today's service with your friends or start a watch party. As for our announcements, first I have a request for those of you who can be here next Sunday. We plan to take down the Christmas decorations, so if you can stay after the service to help, it may be greatly appreciated. It shouldn't take very long, because as we know how the saying goes, many hands make light work. Thank you. Uh, secondly, I'm still taking requests from people interested in any of the items found in the library or the four classrooms, which we are simply giving away. No purchase necessary. Just give me a note or send me an email, and, or you can talk to me in person to let me know what items you would like and the quantity you would like. You can find more details of this, of how this works, in the second announcement in our bulletin today. Um, also, if you would like to buy any of the newer eight-foot tables with the plastic white tabletops that we used in the past for rummage sales, those are available for sale at $15 per table. So if you're interested, uh, let me know. You can pay me or you can leave the money, check or cash, in an envelope in the church office. And you may buy more than one table if you wish. Um, just note that these tables do not fold up, so unless you have a pickup or an SUV, you won't be able to get them home, but perhaps we can arrange a delivery for you <laughs> through with someone else in our church. Um, there are about 12 tables still available, by the way. To read details of the rest of our announcements, you can go online and visit dccdearborn.org, click on DCC Home, and scroll down to Weekly Bulletin. Or if you're on Facebook, simply go to our Facebook page and click on the direct links to the bulletin that are shown there. Uh, something not in your bulletin, um, if, you, if you wish to serve or if you would like to serve as a liturgist on a Sunday in the future, uh, please see Nancy or myself. You won't have to do announcements, just do the reading on Sunday. Uh, we'll call worship, prayer, and vacation, and, and the scripture. Thank you very much. Um, on a personal note, affecting a couple of members of our church, today, January 2nd, is Tony Boyd's birthday. Tony is the uh, widow of a former minister here at Greenfield Congregation, the Reverend Wayne Boyd, who was minister here in the 90s. She's still a member and still supports and watches us weekly. So, uh, happy birthday to Tony. And finally, the altar flowers this morning are for Mark and Susan Dabronski, in honor of and in memory of all who were part of Greenfield Congregational Church, and for all those who take part and have supported Dearborn Congregational Church. Let us worship.
we stand for the call to worship? We are God's beloved people, called Call to lives of kindness, humility, humility, and compassion. God seeks to clothe us with love and to bind us together in harmony. God, God desires that we bear with one another and forgive as Christ forgives. We are God's beloved people, called Call to lives of peace, peace and patience, called Call to live with grateful hearts. We worship the God who calls us beloved. Join me in the prayer of invocation. Holy God, thank you for loving us. Clothe us with compassion toward others. Make it radiate from our actions and deeds. You are the example of love. Help us to be a similar example for other people. Give us a selfless spirit that seeks first to serve others. In Jesus' name, amen. Now please join me in, as we say in unison, 
The passage from Colossians chapter 3 for our scripture reading this morning. Put on them as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Congratulations on successfully socially distancing yourself this morning. <laughs> you did a great job. It's like when you go to the theater and there's like three people in there and you get up and you say, anybody want anything? <laughs> when I was um, teaching virtually mostly, I had a little girl that I had just started. Cutest little girl you ever saw in your whole life. I can't say her name in case her parents, you know, uh, suddenly uh, appear on our Facebook watch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it could happen. And, but she, um, she looks into the camera uh, and uh, face every single lesson. And I try to talk to her. And... Um, I'll say her name and, and how are you? And when she looks into the camera at five years old, what does she see? She sees herself. And she starts doing this with her hair while I'm talking to her. She's totally distracted. She's down here, I think. I, I'm seeing that she's looking at herself like this. And, and finally, I said, you know, I can see you. And she goes, oh, I can't see you, but I see me. <laughs> and she didn't know the word for reflection. You know? <laughs> Today's sermon is about reflecting Jesus. It's a reflection is a representation of the original in the form of an image. It's not the original, but it looks very much like the original and sometimes even identical to, to it. It's meant to show the image of something else. If you remember the lyric that we just sang in Shine Jesus Shine, mirrored here, let our lives tell your story. Listen to Paul's words in Romans 13, 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ. How does one put on Christ? This text that we read today will help us understand what it means by telling followers of Jesus to put on certain things, traits, and fruits that reflect who Jesus is, like compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. In other words, by obeying Colossians 3.12, we obey Romans, we put on Christ. Followers of Jesus reflect Christ. So why should we reflect Jesus? Because we're captivated by his extravagance, grace. See, you can't do it on your own. I can't give you these imperatives and say, you know, be kind, be humble, be loving, do all this kind of stuff, and have you do it without being motivated and captivated by God's extravagance, grace. And getting the motivational piece is very important in this text in Colossians. The book is written to combat a belief system that was drifting away from Christ and pointing people to matters that seemed and felt less spiritual. Real obedience springs from a heart that is captivated by the extravagant grace of God. So this text gives us three different uh, evidences of God's grace. First of all, we are chosen. If you look in verse 12, it says, put on them as God's chosen. Second is holy. 
and third is beloved. The word chosen is in the first order. The word, the two words, holy and beloved, are really uh, derivatives of being chosen. Holy and beloved modify or explain what it means to be chosen. So this word chosen in the Greek is, is the word electos. What do you think that word translates in English? Electos. What do we have in November every four years? Election. Election. Uh, you can hear election of this word. It means to form or gather. The church in the New Testament actually was called ecclesia, um, which meant chosen ones gathering together. Uh, that was That's our word for church, ecclesia. <coughs> The words all over the Bible, it's used of men and God in salvation history. It's used to describe the land of Palestine. It's used to describe Israel. And it's also used to call the individual believers and the Christian community. The term emphasizes the gracious and sovereign initiative of God where he draws men and women to himself for his own glory. A lot of debate about this word chosen because you see there's this doctrine in Christianity called uh, predestination and what it means is that um, or it's called irresistible grace actually what it means that that God has predestined or preordained all who will be saved and all who will be lost and Teresa you could be walking down the street and if God chooses you to favor grace on him you have no you will automatically become a Christian um, it's Calvinism is what it's called it's the doctrine is called Calvinism but there's a lot about this word chosen. We as Christians and the evangelical world do not believe in irresistible grace. We believe that man on his own free will comes to the gospel, repents of their sins and becomes a follower of Jesus. So we don't really follow irresistible grace. But just take that word chosen for what it is. And just, just listen to the beauty of what the word means. It means that a sovereign God who was holy, beautiful, and awe saw fit to be personally gracious to us when we did not deserve it. It means that all the events leading up to the moment you received Jesus were not just a mistake or a chance that God orchestrated every one of them. It means that God bestowed his love on sinful creatures, and it means that the act of God was meant to generate great love in our hearts for God, even if we don't fully understand all of it, even if there is exceptions. It means that when I was 12 years old in vacation Bible school, that a man by the name of Lynn Pike, just by happen chance, did not present the gospel message to me and ask me if I wanted to become a Christian, and later that week was baptized. It wasn't by chance. God chose me. For those of you who are married, do you remember when you asked your wife, to marry you. Actually, no one in this room is married, so I'll look at Facebook. Have you out there in Facebook land. And when your husband or your husband to be asks you to marry marry you him, did you say, Well, that's not fair to all the other girls in Dearborn <laughs> if I married you? No, you didn't. You said, Yes, yes, because you knew that your husband had chosen you out of all the other girls in your board and that he loved you. Secondly, this text refers to us as being holy. And this is where the choice leads holiness. It means that God declares his people to be righteous because of the work of Christ. We are not holy. You know the difference between sinners and Christians? Christians are forgiven for their sins. We are declared holy and righteous by the act of Jesus paying our debt for sin on the cross to a holy God. Ephesians 1.4 says, Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Romans 8.33, Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, just as if I would never sinned. The word justification, just as if I would never sinned. Peter 2, 9 through 10 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had received mercy, but now you have, once you had not received mercy, but now you have 
receive mercy. Do you understand the implication of this? Listen to it again. A people of his own position that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of the darkness into marvelous life. And the third implication is that we are loved. It seems obvious, doesn't it? That choosing and the justifying makes us the recipients of God's amazing love. Some people talk about God's love in a way that seems to imply that they are supremely worthy you are valuable because God loves you. There's actually a gospel song out right now that says, it says, um, he'd rather die than be alone. No. You think God is lonely and needy? No. He, he didn't die so you could be walk in fellowship with him. He died because not of his, uh, your love for him, but because of his love for for you. You are loved. Ephesians 1, 4 through 6 says, In love he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace and which he has blessed us in the beloved. God sets his love on us not because we're so special but because of how special he is. You see. He sets his love on undeserving sinners not to make much them but to make much of himself. He calls us to be loved, not to affirm our worth, but to accentuate his glory. Chosen, holy, and beloved. This captivation with extravagant grace serves as a motivation for what follows. Hear me now. Worship precedes obedience. Worship precedes obedience. I know you guys don't like this song. It's my favorite hymn, And Can It Be? And I shoved it down your throat so many times that you're probably not going to do it. I played it for the prelude today, but we sing this verse over and over again, and I can't just get it out of my head for this message. The third verse says, Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. And let me tell you something. When you're in a dungeon of darkness, and the eye of God diffuses light into that dungeon, <coughs> nothing follows except obedience and worship. So now what reflects Jesus? Let's embrace some of these truths quickly. Followers of Jesus reflect Jesus. So what are some of the truths in our text? Let's look at them. First one is compassion. This is heartfelt graciousness. It's a deep concern for others. There are actually two words here. The first word means inside your body. And I love the King James Version here. Since there's only four of us and the public, I can say this. The King James actually uh, interprets it, bowels of mercy. So we don't when we describe our love for one another and our inwardness, we, we don't really say, wow, my my bowels are just really yearning for you, honey. You got it. You know, we just, well, let's just leave that right there, okay? But, but what do we say? We don't say our intestine yearns for, what do we say? We say our heart. And, but in the King James Version, it meant everything inside of you um, is, is, the second word is mercy. So when you put the two of them together, it means a heart of graciousness and mercy. The bent of the heart, the tendency of his or her life is a tender sympathy for others. Compassion. Oh, we lack compassion so much in our society. I can't even begin to tell you. I, I think to myself when I go to the stores, the grocery stores, or when I'm on the road and around about, and we're so impatient with others. And, and we don't know what that person is going through. You know, even myself, sometimes I'll do something stupid driving, you know, and a corn will honk at me and something, you know, nasty that kind of wakes me up. And I think to myself, oh, if only they knew, you know, what I was just thinking or what was going through or something. And then, but we need so much compassion in society. The second word is kindness. And this means an abundance of goodness. Uh, you, can, you can translate it generous, a generous spirit. And uh, the... Uh, Third is humility. This is the one word that I don't have to work on. I'm probably the most humble person I have ever met in my entire life. I'm filled with humility. No, 
Humility <laughs> is such uh, every single person in this building and watching on Facebook. This is something we could all work on. Uh, it was this word was used negatively in two eighteen and two twenty three to note the shallow humility of the humility of the false teachers. The difference here is that humility is to call us to emulate the life of Jesus, and it's to put on Christ like humility. Um, it demonstrates itself in real actions. Humility isn't just an attribute; it's an action. Um, the Bible tells us that it's dependent upon Christ and that we should consider others more important than ourselves. How much have we talked about that? And it's a willingness to submit to others and a commitment to be obedient to God, even submitting to others when they don't deserve it. How hard is that, you know? How many times, you know? Meekness. My favorite definition of meekness is power under control. Meekness doesn't mean weakness. It means a choice to be gentle when you don't really have to. It means sometimes turning the other cheek. It means sometimes not retorting back to that friend or neighbor or relative that said something smart to you. It means forbearance, which is the next one, patience. This is closely linked to meekness, but it means putting up with and bearing the exasperating conduct of others without flying into a rage or suddenly wanting to get even. That's so hard. We're taught just by the sitcoms that we grew up on. It started with like, you know, the Roseanne show. These kids all smarting off to their parents and everybody thought it was so funny. We're conditioned to think it's cute and it's funny to go back at someone and to really give them a tongue lashing. Who, who remembers Julia on Designing Women? Remember? Yeah, yeah. Remember how she's just giving? We just thought that was so cute. and good. Yeah. It's not... The strength that it's not describing mirroring mirroring Christ, not having that kind of patience. You know why there's exasperating people in your life? You know why? God put them there to teach you patience. <laughs> so tomorrow, when you meet that one person that you think, oh, no, they're going to tell me about how the whole movie goes from beginning to end, or, oh, they're the most exasperating person, I want you to walk up to them and go, I know why God put you in my life. <laughs> and I say, why? You go, never mind. I just know why you're here. Go ahead. Tell me your story or whatever it is. God puts those in to see. And finally, or, or, or almost lastly, forbearance and forgiving one another. There's two that I'm combining um, because they're not the same, but they go together. Forbearance or bearing with one another is to put up with each other, to endure each other, to embrace the suffering that comes with dealing with people. The word is used in 2 Thessalonians 1-4 through for our response to tribulations and trials. We all know that dealing with other people involves tension and conflict at many levels, and Paul calls believers the kind of life that is not easy, annoyed, quickly put out, easily offended, quick to draw conclusions, or someone you have to walk eggshells around. How many people do you know like that? <laughs> sure. You know why they never see themselves that way? Because everybody's walking around eggshells. They know they can't tell them the truth. Because yeah. they'll fly yeah. off the handle. They never see it that way. I know someone yeah. who this week, or maybe it was the week of Christmas. No, it was this week. Yelled at me. Actually yelled at me. Because I mentioned that they should be careful. Um, because the roads were slippery and they were traveling somewhere else. And... Um, the, the, the response was funny to be, you know, uh, I've been out, out, I thank you very much for letting me know. I mean, there was just this, you know, kind of very overly sensitive response. And um, I thought to myself later. So I, I went back and said something, a little church, or I said, well, have you been to where you were going, the city you were going? Because that's where I am now, and it's an hour drive from you. And, and there was no, no response. And, and, you know, I'm a teacher, so I said, no, no, answer my question. Have you been there? <laughs> and said that so you know because I'm really good at the Julia Sugar Baker retorts I was <laughs> trained for it and uh, the response was wow where did that come from you see people that are highly oversensitive don't see themselves as that way and I think it's sometimes it's important that we tell each other what it's what, what are that we're just being hypersensitive you know I said I have a, a lot of friends that I think are are hypersensitive, and, and oftentimes I'll say, well, you know, sometimes, you know, it's so easy to misinterpret a text or an email or a comment or a lack of comment. 
Uh, hypersensitive people will say, wow, I got a new hairdo and nobody said anything about it, you know, that kind of thing. We had a woman at this church that left a few years back and I made the phone call and asked her why and she said, my husband did everything around that church and not one person said thank you to him. Well, shame on this church for not thinking that man for all he did and he did do a lot and shame on that woman for thinking that her husband was serving people and not God. Forbearance and forgiving one another. And then the final one is love. And here we have what is often called the crowning grace that believers are to put on and love is the first part of the fruit of the Spirit. The summary of law and the greatest of all Christian virtues. And it's the ability to show the world that we're all different in our own way. And that we can put up with each other's differences and consider others better than ourselves because we love as Christ has loved us and died for us. So, this morning, as I am a pianist, we're all different, right? So, that's John. other and loving each other despite our differences and it is mirroring the reflection of God's extravagant grace. Amen. 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 <clears throat>
And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's love? Died he for me. <clears throat> it's the new year. It's a time where we make resolutions, a time where we try to grow, try to lose weight, try to exercise, try to get ahead financially. But today, in the first Sunday of the new year, let's take a spiritual inventory at the cross. Let's remember Jesus' death, that it found us out, and we have experienced extravagant grace. And let us think about what that means in our lives, and let us thank God and worship him through the institution of the Lord's Supper. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we thank you for extravagant grace. We thank you that your love can be reflected in our lives. We use this day, this Sunday, where worship was changed from Saturday to Sunday to preach your, your death, burial, and resurrection and the price that was paid for our sins. We thank you and we worship you for it. We praise you for lighting up our dungeon and we praise you in our day-to-day -day life. Today, we remember the words of institution that your son gave on that night. And he broke the bread and he blessed it. And he said, take, this is my body, which was broken for you. The body of Christ. And in the same manner, he took the cup and he said, this represents my blood which will be shed for you, which is a new covenant for a new kingdom, for a new time. Drink ye all of it. The blood of Christ. Shall we go to the Lord in prayer? Our Father and our God, we're so thankful for this day that you have given us that we can worship we're thankful for your sacrifice on the cross. And we're thankful that you have given us a love that can be spread throughout the world. Today, we petition for those who are friends and members of this body. We pray for Jeff and Chris, friends of Liz Schlaff, who are hospitalized with COVID, and for Tracy Dobes, and for Marianne Cloud, for Dee Shelby, the mother of Kevin, for baby Caden, who's still awaiting a heart transplant. We pray for Joanne Heron and Cindy Toma and Michelle Campo, for Will Worthington, for our shut-ins, Gail Wagner and Pat Stocko, Sue Wilson, Carrie Goldie, and Lois Kuttner. Pray for my friend's mother, Mark Stansberry, an old school saint, 95 years old, who's in the hospital with COVID suffering. Make your presence known to her and to that family. We come together in one accord, few, but of like-mindedness and like spirits. And we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, Father who, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
fuse to quickly pray. I woke the dungeons flamed with light. Amen. Amen. Amen.